Is there a a outside of the box mechanism that perhaps you haven't spoken about on other podcasts with Rhonda Patrick or people might be unaware of with Sprouts that just at a high level you think would be interesting for people to be aware of? Yeah, antiviral against COVID and the common cold virus. Um, and there's now um, evidence from colleagues at Johns Hopkins, this came out two or three years ago, showing that it was it was protective against um, SARS-CoV-2. This is back in the early days of the pandemic. Yeah, this is a new kind of booster. Yeah, I'll, I'll say, and boy, that had me uh, that had me keeping my broccoli sprout uh, and supplement game uh, in there. But you couldn't talk but, about it, and you still, unfortunately, they weren't. They have not. This group at Hopkins has not followed it up with a clinical study. I, I wish they had. And so it's a hypothesis at the moment. No, well, it's it's based on cell culture and mouse studies. Right. So, but and I mean, how it it's, plays out in humans is. A little bit speculative. It is a little bit speculative, but there's there's work that's been done um, by others. Uh, probably f five or six papers. Um, is that so? It's somehow affecting the immune response. Yeah, yeah, and and ability of the virus to reinfect. Just one one thing on the practical. Like we're in Los Angeles, we well, had air pollution. We had um, wildfires here. What is broccoli sprouts, either the supplement or the seeds, what does that do for someone exposed to smoking, secondhand smoking, yeah. or um, wildfires? So let me tell you what we did in a, in a number of trials in China, and the most recent one actually looked at the, do the effect of increasing dose. Um, we looked at a number of the common chemical constituents of, of the smoke, the pollution that was all, you know, all over. This was near Shanghai um, and found. And so we we looked at the urine and the, the blood of people in this trial. This was a trial I mentioned was, was over three months. And we found increased levels of metabolite detoxification products of benzene and acrolein. These are two of the common constituents of the smoke. Um, so what does that mean? That means the bodies of these people that were on broccoli sprouts or glucoraphanin versus those that weren't uh, was doing a better job of detoxifying this this the smoke. Um, as I say, we did do a dose uh, a dose effect trial on on that, and that su supplements or substantiates this comment that we made about two servings a day or thirty to fifty milligrams of glucoraphanin. Um, so we actually, and this is with my uh, recently, uh, tragically deceased uh, colleague, Tom Kensler, well, we, uh, he and I uh, and, and, and others have written a number of papers recently where, where we compared all of the clinical studies and all of the animal studies that have been done with sulforaphane and looked at the doses and the dose ranges. And yeah, I mean, we get a, we get a tenfold difference uh, or more than a tenfold difference in dose that people have given over the years 20 years or so um, and we tracked those studies which showed a positive effect and those studies which didn't okay i gotta go back to other this isn't necessarily non-nrf2 effects but we've seen dramatic effects in a very small n of one trial this is this is not a formally sanctioned clinical trial, but one in which um, I believe 15 individuals uh, reported their results in the non-motor symptoms of Parkinson's by people taking sulforaphane that they made in their kitchen. They had broccoli seeds. They digested them with the myrosinase from mustard seed, and they consumed the same dose every day, actually only once a week. They found once a week was a sweet spot. And no one's tested that formally with a control. Give me the money. I mean, that's just the no. This was done. This was a controlled trial, but oh, it was it, a, it, it was a controlled trial. We didn't we didn't look uh, or they didn't look at blood levels of anything. They didn't verify the sulforaphane levels in the dose. They didn't collect urine and quantify you know metabolites, but they fastidiously recorded symptoms and reduction in symptoms. And in fact. It led to a group in the U.S. that I'm helping out, a not-for-profit, um, which is trying to replicate that with that work 
in the U.S. This work was done in Switzerland with a guy who was, he was a Ph.D. chemist. He was, had formerly been climbing in the Alps. He was 78 when he got Parkinson's. Um, he was bedridden for days at a time, all sorts of non-motor symptoms. I mean, he had some motor symptoms too. Um, he started taking sulforaphane because he'd heard of our work, making it himself. Um, and he went back to climbing in the Alps. Um, wow. A remarkable story. Wow. Yeah, I mean, this was this is phenomenal. And and other people in this group that he sponsored um, had similar, not as dramatic successes. But the other area where there have been really substantial effects is with autism. And there are many trials now, uh, mine, uh, trials I was involved with, with a group at Harvard and then at uh, Mass Medical Center, um, and also with, with gr a group in China, and then there's a group in Iran that's done some of this work that I wasn't involved with, obviously, showing effects on behavior in autistic kids. Uh, and yeah. these are like placebo controlled? Yes. They are. Yes. They're, they're, you know, NIH, or the, one of them was Department of Defense funded, um, for, formally sanctioned, ethics board approval, expensive. Wow. Um, and, and I, in most cases, measured the amount of sulforaphane in in, in the doses. And what type of, how significant were those effects in terms of someone's behavior and quality of life? They were very significant. And and in the in this study, I, I wish I had, I need a graph. We can put it on I screen. A, yeah, in this study, for example, the one the first one that we did uh, in, in Massachusetts, um, we, we checked, we gave them daily sulforaphane um, that I made in my lab from broccoli seeds. Um, we checked at baseline, then after four weeks, eight weeks, I think uh, 12 weeks, and then we did it, and then the intervention stopped at either 12 or 16 weeks, and then we did a four week washout where they got nothing. And the curves of some of these behaviors was remarkable, substantially, highly significantly different from the placebo. And this is stuff like repetitive behaviors. I think you need um, it right away, Simon. I think you need it. <laughs> I'm t well, this is, uh, imagine if I wasn't on it. <laughs> but but so some of these very, um, I won't say destructive, but very, very interfering behaviors that autistic uh, subjects manifest were dramatically reduced. So is that common knowledge? It's, it's become pretty common knowledge in the autism community, which is where it's needed, but could it, could it use a louder, like a louder megaphone? Is it, would it be common knowledge? Is it in the guidelines? Do they have guidelines that, that recommend specific nutrients or supplements for people with autism? I haven't I'd seen it. I haven't seen it. too much. I think like in the Facebook groups and the mothers. It seems and, a little fringe. You know. Well, it seems I'm, I'm sort of, I'm not ready to chastise I'm not, I'm not you saying, for saying it's I'm not, fringe, I'm not saying but, that but, it's a knock on the science. I just, I mean, the, the, at least to me, the concept seems fringe. Look, the traditional, the, the allopathic medicine community thinks anything nutrient or supplement is fringe. Unless it's a drug or surgery, they're not as interested or as well-trained. Was the dose in those studies back to that 30 to 50 yes. milligrams? So it is, yes, it was. it's what we'd, we'd call that like a physiologic dose in that it's not that that is completely achievable from eating broccoli sprouts absolutely itself. i'm i'm glad you mentioned that because that was that was a line that we used in our petitions to approve to approve some of the early trials is look you can, people are getting this enthusiastic broccoli eaters are getting this we're just making sure that this is what they get and that the control groups don't get none yeah simon can so, you write up an irb and let's uh, get a test uh, done Leave with me. So, <laughs> is there is there any safety or toxicity adverse effects from all of these trials? So there's a bunch of trials on autism. There's other human clinical trials. So I'm sure the safety profile has has been assessed to some extent. It has been, and the answer is there are not there are no toxicity um, toxicities at all. There are m tens of thousands of doses that have been given in clinical studies now. I mean, if you look at you know duration and number of days and number of people there are none interestingly extraordinary enough. i recently ran my full labs through function health 
and I have to say the results were eye-opening. Turns out my ApoB was higher than ideal, probably thanks to a little too much coconut yogurt. I also found out I was slightly low in copper, something that I would have never suspected without testing. On the flip side, my biological age came back 13.3 years younger than my actual age, a calculation based on the work of aging researcher Dr. Morgan Levine. So all in all, I've got a few tweaks to make to optimize my lipids and nutrient status, but overall my blood work says I'm doing pretty well. That's what I love about function. You get access to over 160 biomarkers covering everything from hormones and inflammation to nutrients, toxins, cardiovascular risk, and more. And all your results are housed in one beautiful platform, all tracked over time. Once you get your results, you can make informed changes before small issues become big ones. To get started, head to functionhealth.com forward slash Simon Hill. The first 1000 people get a $100 credit toward their membership. That's functionhealth.com forward slash Simon Hill.